deadly contagion has been feared by clinicians since long before the advent of germ theory. This whole issue was brought to the fore yet again in 2014 with the terrible West African Ebola epidemic. For the purposes of this uh, session today, I want to talk about pathogens known to pose a mortal risk to intensive care staff. And I'll use two criteria to define such infectious diseases. One, they must be communicable to intensive care staff despite the application of standard precautions like uh, basic hand hygiene. And two, they must have, must have some sort of significant mortality in otherwise healthy adults. So we exc I'm excluding things like viral gastroenteritis or the common cold, etc. And when you use these two simple criteria, the list of pathogens that fulfill them is actually very limited. The first group are the viral hemorrhagic fever viruses, most notably the filoviruses, Ebola and its cousin Marburg, and to a lesser extent Lassa, also from West Africa, and Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. These are much less easily transmitted from human to human, and the mortality is significantly less than the filoviruses, Ebola and Marburg. The second major group are the coronaviruses that are associated with SARS and MERS. SARS was a particular concern because it emerged as if out of nowhere and then disappeared unexpectedly. So it is quite conceivable that it will emerge yet again. I'll also make mention, I also want to make mention of influenza viruses, although as of mid-2017, they do not fulfill these criteria. Uh, zoonotic influenza viruses, avian influenza, certainly has a high mortality but does not transmit easily hu from human to human. And of course, uh, seasonal epidemic influenza transmits easily but does not have a, a, a very significant mortality in otherwise healthy adults. But it's not hard to imagine uh, that with simple recombination such a new pathogen could emerge. And I was, I was reminded as I was coming here that I left one other pathogen off this list, and that is in fact the pneumonic plague, which has undergone a bit of a recrudescence in Madagascar at the moment, and nosocomial transmission of this pathogen in hospitals has also been described, although it is exceedingly rare. So under what circumstances might these pathogens be encountered in the intensive care unit? And I can think in general of three circumstances, three general circumstances under which such pathogens might be encountered. The first of these is in random travellers. This has a ca happened a number of times over the last decade or so, and some of these events have been quite significant. Um, the probably the two most notable events were the SARS event uh, in 2003, uh, which originated in China and uh, spread uh, to, particularly to Canada, Toronto, where in the end more than 400 people were infected through the hospitals and over 40 people died. And then the virus disappeared. The second, of course, more recent event was the Ebola epidemic. And we saw uh, transmission to, uh, from travellers to local healthcare workers in Dallas and in Madrid. Uh, with two healthcare workers being uh, infected by a, a traveller from Liberia. Fortunately, in this case, none of the healthcare workers died. One notable thing about all of these, these cases in travellers is that the epidemic in the source country had been identified long before it, had been, it was introduced into the hospitals in, in, the, in Europe and the United States. And so with simple precautions, it should be possible, at least in theory, to identify and isolate these patients early because it was known that Ebola was happening. It was known that SARS was happening. And sometimes, although it sounds simple, our processes are not ideal. One thing I commend to you is a, a, a website that we commonly use in infectious disease. I don't know if you use this or are familiar with it, and that is ProMed. I use it all the time. Patient come, you know, I get a call. A patient's come back from Myanmar. He's in the intensive care unit. He's sick. 
His malaria films are negative. We don't know what's wrong with him. One of the very first things I do as an infectious diseases physician, I go to ProMed, I look at the map, I point at Myanmar and I ask myself, is something happening in Myanmar that I need to know about? You can do that too or you can get your infectious diseases people to do that for you. The point being, um, with, with those epidemics and each, with those introduced, infection, introduced infections, the epidemic was known before the patients was, were arrived. One thing we discovered with the Ebola epidemic was Australians' knowledge of geography, particularly African geography, isn't very good. <laughs> and most Australians cannot tell you whether Liberia is anywhere near Zambia or whether Zambia is anywhere near Kenya. Most Australians don't have a good idea. So it's a good idea to have a look at a map. The second circumstance under which intensive care theoretically might encounter these pathogens is in the context of the apocalyptic pandemic, something that science fiction writers have uh, written about uh, for years. Uh, this is a scene from that wonderful movie, Contag the Steven Soderbergh movie, Contagion. I don't know if you've seen that. It's a fantastic movie. And this is his, this is his image of uh, what a, a, an apocalyptic pandemic might look like. But in fact, we got a little glimpse of what that looked like, might look like, in West Africa. Uh, I, I had the very great privilege of being invited to be part of a team to travel to Sierra Leone to set up Australia's first ever Ebola treatment centre there. And I can tell you it was an extraordinary, exciting, scary, surreal experience. And it was not unlike the images that you see from the science fiction uh, movies like, like Contagion. Uh, people were dying in their, in their houses. There were mass graves. We had checkpoints around the country to stop the spread of the virus. And th this is one of my favourite photographs. It shows uh, This is the, the, um, one of the guards outside the Ebola treatment centre. If you look at the, the guard here, he has an automatic rifle in his right hand and, a th and an electronic thermometer in his left hand. <laughs> <laughs> Scary stuff. By the time when we arrived in Sierra Leone in November of 2014, Great, Greater Freetown was seeing about 300 new Ebola cases per week. Now, that's a city with a population of about a million. If you translate that to Sydney or Melbourne, we're talking about... 1,500 new cases of Ebola per week in Sydney or Melbourne. So what is the role of the intensive care unit in that circumstance? None. It has no role. Hospitals, in fact, as we know them, probably have no role. The hospital system had fallen over completely. So the name of the game, and this is what we learnt out of West Africa, is that if epidemics like this ever occur again, they have to be stopped at source. And that's the third circumstance that I want to talk about, and that is supporting a medical response to an overseas epidemic. There, the, the, you guys in this room uh, could have two roles in that. First of all, the experience and the skills in this room would have been perfect for use in West Africa. I don't know, did any of you go to West Africa? Anyone here? So there were intensivists there, and your skills would have been invaluable. But if not that, then supporting those sick, those sick healthcare workers who returned from, from the response in, in, the, in that event, and that, in the event that someone got sick, and that certainly did occur. What was the concept of the response to the West African Ebola epidemic? Um, some some uh, epidemiologists from Yale in 2014, when, as the epidemic was getting under control, worked out that, we, that just three things needed to be done to bring that epidemic under rapid control. That was to isolate the sick, to quarantine the, the contacts, and to bury the dead safely. And if those three things were done, the epidemic would come under rapid control. And that turned out to be the case, in fact. Doing that, of course, in West Africa is not, was not a logistically easy thing to do. There were two operations. There was something called Operation United Assistance, 
which was led by the United States military, which set up 10 Ebola treatment centres in Liberia. Similarly, in Sierra Leone, there was Operation Grit Rock, which established seven Ebola treatment centres uh, across Sierra Leone. What I think people don't appreciate, if you weren't in, haven't been involved in humanitarian work, is that although the military, who did a fantastic job in setting up these centres, they don't have the capacity to actually run them. The running of these centres was done by various agencies from the, around the world. Australia has the capacity to run age, uh, units like this. In fact, there are two different models that Australia could have chosen. Uh, the, the, the government of the day chose a, a private uh, company, Aspen, which does a lot of work for the military, and they were very competent and professional. And the other group that could potentially do it, and I, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I think they were very keen to do it, is OSMAT. And I don't know if any of you inv are involved in OSMAT, but OSMAT traditionally is involved in trauma and disaster management, but is, I, 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 has, is expanding its uh, purview to look after infectious disease, diseases. Uh, this is the Hastings Airfield Ebola Treatment Centre that we ran, the, the Australian Ebo uh, Treatment Centre we ran. It was a fantastic unit built by the British, or by the British engineers. Well, they, they supervised the building, but it was the local labour and uh, builders that actually constructed the, the centre. It was a fantastic centre, well thought out, well planned. And one of the things that made it, I mean, it was scary. One of the things that made it tolerable for me personally, and I think for all of us, was knowing that there was an escape route because, of course, all the medical infrastructure had completely fallen down and the uh, military uh, supported us, the British military supported us fantastically. They had a naval ship off the coast uh, in case of non-Ebola cases, in case anyone got injured because uh, there were no hos functioning hospitals and they would also transport patients back to the Royal Free Hospital in London if anyone uh, became infected and, in fact, they looked after four healthcare workers that got infected. Uh, whilst we were there. Just to, just, we'll just talk briefly about Ebola. Ebola um, is a filovirus, just clinically divides up into three stages. The first stage is just a non-specific febrile illness, lasts about a week. The patients, quite characteristically, we talked about this Ebola stare, they would get off the ambulances and, sta and stagger in, sort of glaring through you as if I'm not sure whether it was the cytokine release or whether there was some degree of encephalitis involved, uh, but they would stagger in with a fever. The second week uh, was the um, uh, gastrointestinal phase with intense vomiting and diarrhoea. It wasn't of the intensity you see with cholera, so I don't, I don't believe these patients were dying of simple, dehydr dry, simple dehydration. I think that's a simplification. So we, weren't, we had cholera beds, but we didn't use them. It wasn't that severe. They had it, but it wasn't that severe. Uh, bleeding, hematemesis, vaginal bleeding, occurred in about 10, between 10 and 20%. Not all of them, of course, got bleeding. So even though it's called a hemorrhagic fever, not all got bleeding. And then in the third week, about half would just die, and the other half would survive. And it was... Un relatively unpredictable, who would live and who would die. The very young were more, more likely to die, and the very old, which means anyone over the age of 40. Um, <laughs> can I say, before we went there, we were told that no one over the age of 40 had survived Ebola at that stage. That, that isn't the case now. But that was the information we got as we were getting on the plane. So this, this wasn't very reassuring. But that, there... <laughs> Um, the, the, the mortality there is much higher as well. One of the critical things we learned there, and we had already been beginning to discover beforehand, was that it's the donning and particularly the doffing of the personal protective equipment that is critical, and that most of the contamination where healthcare workers got infected probably occurred during the doffing process. And so in the, in the treatment centre we had uh, two donning stations and two doffing stations which was supervised by observers, which, which we trained initially. Uh, these were just uh, people from the local village, uh, but they became expert in ensuring that we knew how to take off the equipment um, correctly without contaminating ourselves, and our lives ultimately depended on them. So that's the donning station, and this is the doffing station. As we're, this is as we're training the staff to use it. And they became invaluable 
I, I, if, if nothing else out of this, please learn that they are, the, they are critical, and I'll come back to that shortly. So what about healthcare worker infections? Um, OK, let's compare West Africa with the United States and Europe. In West Africa, there were 815 healthcare workers infected, of whom two-thirds died. Uh, that's out of a total of 27,200 uh, Ebola patients treated. So for it, one healthcare worker died for every 33 patients treated. In the USA and Europe, where the numbers were smaller, some aspects of it look a bit scarier. So uh, there were three locally acquired Ebola infections, one in Spain and two in the United States. Well, both of those were in the one hospital. None of the healthcare workers that acquired infection in Europe or the United States died, but they only treated 24 cases from Africa. So that means that a healthcare worker infection rate of one healthcare worker infection for every eight Ebola tra uh, patients treated, which is completely unacceptable. That cannot be allowed. We, that would be unacceptable in any unit. So what do we know? So we know that in West Africa, the proportion of Ebola infections and healthcare workers out of the total number of Ebola cases diagnosed fell dramatically during the course of the epidemic as the processes got better. So to begin with, a lot of these infections were occurring in existing general hospitals. So they were all muddled together. People were all muddled together in the, in the emergency department. Um, and so there was cross-infection between patients, cross-infection between healthcare workers and patients, and it was a complete disaster. But as time go, went by, healthcare workers' infections didn't disappear. They still existed, but the numbers dr decreased dramatically. Now, the numbers in the US, of course, are smaller, but this graph helps a little bit. There were, actually, there, was a, there were actually only two healthcare workers infected in the United States, and it was only in that one hospital, the Dallas Presbyterian. So that was a general hospital where there was, they had one Ebola patient that infected two um, uh, healthcare workers. But when you look at all the other 11 uh, patients from Africa that they treated, there were no associated uh, healthcare worker infections. And these were all in designated. Ebola treatment centres, such as we, we have here in Australia. So there's a designated Ebola treatment centre, of course, for every state. I have some reservations about having an Ebola treat, a designated Ebola treatment centre for every state. In Queensland, for example, it's Royal Brisbane. In, in New South Wales, it's Westmead. Victoria is the Alfred, isn't it? I, and around the country, etc. Insofar as I fear that if we had more than one case, those hospitals would become overwhelmed very rapidly. So it's incumbent upon all teaching hospitals to be, have the capacity to deal with highly infectious disease. The Royal Free Hospital in London looked after the most of the, uh, the largest number of uh, Ebola patients outside Africa, a total of four. Uh, they had no healthcare workers uh, infected. Now, they had a very specialised way of doing it using this thing called the Trexler Isolator Tent, which they developed in the, in the 1970s. I think in practical terms, I just wouldn't be going there. They, they, were very, they were very proud of this facility, and obviously they trained to do this, and they were the centre for the United Kingdom, and it certainly seemed to work. But you wouldn't want to be introducing that into your hospital. One other useful thing that they said there was that they put jugular lines in early. They had their own um, point-of-care testing laboratory next to uh, their, treatment, um, their treatment beds, and they could do these tests in that uh, laboratory. Uh, in the United States, the, the Ebola patients were treated in units which were a bit more, much more like the standard that we would use here, a standard intensive care unit, negative pressure isolation room uh, with, this with the usual um, uh, personal protective equipment that's similar to what we might use here. One thing that was critical both in Africa and in the United States that they, that they talk about is the staffing level. Now, in, Afri in Africa, it was fairly standard across the units. Okay, that, okay then an, an eight-hour shift. Okay, we, uh, okay, then an eight-hour shift, uh, you needed four staff members because each staff member would enter three times for a 40-minute session only over that, that period. And the United States adopted a, single, uh, a similar staffing level. 
Is it worth the risk? Well, if you look at the mortality in West Africa in Ebola treatment centres, we had a mortality of about 58% or between 50 and 70%. This is one particular study of five Ebola treatment centres. In the United States and Europe, their mortality was significantly lower at only 18.5%. Now, why it was lower, we can't say for sure. There, was no, there were no controlled trials. All of these patients in the US and, and Europe did receive uh, experimental treatments, but most of them also received advanced life support. If you, if you assumed that those in the United States and Europe who received advanced life support would have died without it, then their mortality would have been 41%, implying that that, what, that advanced life support uh, was the reason uh, was, one, was a key reason why these patients survive. So in summary, beware of the sick traveller. You can reduce the risk of infection to your staff. The single most important thing I would ask you to go away with today is to, to identify trained observers uh, that you will use in the event of encountering uh, an infectious patient. Training staff is all very well now but, they, but your staff will forget what to do when the real thing happens. But knowing who your trained observers will be when an epidemic occurs, then, or when an, out, when an infectious patient arrives, that you can do. Normally that would be infection control staff. It might be intensive care staff, but normally infection control staff I think would be the best group. Adequate staffing levels, four patients per shift, and for those of you who are